I'm an Indian citizen and I'm here. All of you are equally Indian citizens and that is why all of you are here. Today the question is, are we Indian citizens? That is what this government wants us to answer. And that is why we are offended. We are offended because a set of um, politicians or political leaders who have had no role in the freedom movement, who have had no role in the formation of this wonderful country, they are the ones who are saying, we will determine who the citizens of this country is. And that is a very, very offensive idea to all of us. If um, the question is, uh, see, there have been in the last, ever since BJP uh, came to power, there have been disturbing trends. As uh, the speakers before me alluded to, uh, there have been disturbing trends. We know the color of the BJP, the government in power in the center, and uh, the kind of uh, uh, violence that has been unleashed against the minorities, lynching, the uh, beef eating uh, issue, all those things. And then finally the assault on 377, the JNK, and then the Ayodhya issue. So one after the other, uh, there has been undermining of the freedom of the minorities in this country and that has been an ongoing process. But you did not see the kind of movement or the protest, uh, the solidarity that has been expressed by people across the country coming out on the streets and protesting, starting from the young to the old. Um, for example, in Shahin Bagh, I, on the television, I was surprised to see there was a 92-year-old lady, a Muslim lady who spoke up and uh, who said, who is this Modi to ask about who my father is? I can tell you who my father is. He said some Shahid Khan, some other Khan was a grandfather, the great-grandfather. She mentioned some 10 generations and she said, Modi is going to come and ask me about who my grandfather is? Ask him to come and talk to me is what so powerful her statement was so that is a kind of um, revulsion and uh, uh, kind of jolt that this move has given to all of us to each one of us why is it so it's because see what what do you mean by citizenship why are we all so concerned about being a citizen of this country and why are we all so concerned about this move by the government by which they take an action in favor of a particular religion to the exclusion of a particular religion? Why are we all so offended? It is because citizenship means a person who is domiciled in a particular country will start enjoying civic as well as political rights. They are the persons who are going to determine the future of that country. And that's what happened when we drafted the constitution. It begins by seeing we the people of India. It does not say Indian National Congress. It is we, the people of India, who gave the constitution to ourselves. Now that people of India represented people of all communities, all religion. And that is the idea of the constitution. The constitution says that this country is a representative of all the religions, all the communities, everybody who is here. And so in part two of the constitution, which said who the citizens are at the time of drafting of the constitution in 1950, there is no reference to religion at all. It says whoever was found in India, in 1948, 
all of them are Indians. If somebody had migrated to Pakistan and had come back, then there are certain conditions imposed. That's how the constitution recognized citizenship. It never said if you're a Hindu, then it is two years or five years. If, you, if you're a Muslim, then certain conditions. No. It was based on your right to reside in the place and you're claiming the citizenship. That's about it. Now, what are we faced with? We are faced with a parliamentary law. This is not a constitutional amendment, mind you. It's a parliamentary law. Now, a question may arise. If the constitution does not provide for citizenship in a, to be recognized in a particular way, how is a parliament competent to do it? There is a provision, unfortunately, as, as the, what is to be noted is that in 1947, India was faced with the specter of partition. Therefore, people were, there was a uh, migration of people in large numbers. Many people were not sure about what their future is going to be. So from March or early 1947 onwards, there was a mass exodus of people going across the border this way and that way. So in 1950, when the constitution was framed, the uh, constituent assembly was alive to the fact that there could be a cross-border migration even in future. Therefore, what they decided was, let us enable the parliament to frame a law in future as far as, as far as grant of citizenship as well as its termination. Therefore, Article 11 in the constitution said, parliament may frame a law in order to determine a grant of citizenship as well as its termination. That's what it says. Now, the question that arises is, can the parliament disregard the constitution and frame any law that it chooses? If in the initial stages, the constitution did not recognize grant of citizenship based on religion, can the parliament today amend it and say, I grant citizenship to certain people belonging to a, some religion and to the exclusion of people belonging to another religion. That's a very legitimate question that arises and that is what we are asking. <clears throat> the BJP seems to think and that, that's apparent from the manner in which the Home Minister has addressed the nation in various uh, uh, fora as well as in the parliament that we have the power and therefore we decide. And their only justification given for this kind of a classification which was mentioned by Mr. Manuraj is that uh, these Hindus and Buddhists and Christians, Parsis and Jains and Sikhs have faced persecution in these three countries and therefore we um, and they have migrated here because of uh, religious persecution and therefore we grant them citizenship. We think that they are in a very pitiable condition. They've come here for a better life. We want to protect their interests and therefore we grant them citizenship. Now questions have been asked across uh, the country. Why have you, there are Muslims also persecuted, Ahmadiyas in Pakistan. We have the Sri Lankan Tamils in, uh, from Sri Lanka. We have the Christians uh, from Bhutan. You have the Rohingyas. They are also from neighboring countries, but they are not Hindus, barring the Sri Lankan Tamils. What happens to them? There is no answer except to say that we have granted, decided on granting citizenship to these people because they are persecuted. And they have given the mic to Mr. Harish Salve, senior advocate of the Supreme Court, who I understand was behind the drafting of this whole thing, to say that the classification is fine. Supreme Court has recognized under classification uh, law need not encompass across the board for everybody and therefore there is nothing wrong in the classification. 
it achieves the objects which are set up uh, set out in the amendment namely we want to give a better status to the persecuted hindus from across the board that is their answer of course on um, on the question of um, uh, the validity of the classification much argument is being advanced but <clears throat> i want to go to a more fundamental question now does this amendment meet the core values of the constitution forget about classification does can the parliament enact a law which is highly discriminatory as against one particular religion and say i have the power under article 11 and therefore i can do as i want now there lies the fallacy because if you read the constitution and the powers of the parliament the parliament derives its power to draft a law from article 245 of the constitution and that article begins by saying subject to the provisions of the constitution parliament may make laws for the whole or any part of the territory of india so it's not as if the parliament can draft any law that it pleases the law drafted by the parliament has to be subject to the provisions of the constitution and schedule 7 of the constitution which mentions the items or the topics on which the parliament can draft uh, legislation mentions in item 17 citizenship naturalization and aliens therefore parliament does have the power to draft the law on citizenship but its powers are limited by the provisions of the constitution now what do the provisions of the constitution say one of the basic structures is secularism and secularism has been interpreted and by has been understood by all of us as there is freedom of religion in the private sphere but the state shall not involve religion in any of its democratic and its public activities the state shall distance itself from religious propagation in any of its activities now that is made clear in article 28 which says no religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution wholly maintained out of state funds why do they say that the constitution says that because it wants the state to distance itself from religion in its governmental spheres now grant of citizenship is undoubtedly a sovereign function in that sovereign function can the parliament say that the government shall take religion as the basis of grant of citizenship that is a question that arises now i'll just mention a few other articles which are relevant one article 14 was mentioned by mr manuraj which says any person is entitled to be given equality similarly article 21 which guarantees the fundamental right to life also applies to non citizens also so when there are illegal immigrants from muslim community are they not entitled to protection of life they are also entitled to be uh, given the right to life under our constitution um the other thing is we have direct to principles of state policy which say article 38 state shall promote uh, and secure and protect a social order which is informed with justice social economic and political and that shall inform all institutions of national life now so apart from that there is a further amendment which imposes fundamental duties on all of us and some of which are to abide by the constitution and respect its ideals it doesn't say the provisions of the constitution 
it says the citizen shall respect the ideals of the constitution cherish and follow the noble ideals of the constitution that inspired our national struggle for freedom that's my duty and therefore i am here to speak up to uphold and protect the sovereignty unity and integrity of india to promote harmony and spirit of brotherhood among all transcending religious linguistic and other diversities now i ask these parliamentarians do they cease to have these obligations under the constitution once they go inside the parliament they continue to be citizens of this country and these fundamental duties are their obligations too they can't say i enjoy immunity inside the parliament and therefore i can forget all these noble ideals of the constitution and frame whichever law i want that's not what they are supposed to do and look at the manner in which secularism pervades all the laws so much so that in our election law representation of peoples act 1951 which enables people to contest uh, parliamentary elections and assembly elections and procedures are laid down in that if a candidate propagates or uh, canvasses for votes during the course of electoral process on the basis of religion it is treated as a corrupt practice and it's treated as an electoral offense now i want to ask a candidate cannot take any action based on religion while canvassing but after going and sitting inside the parliament he can take action based on religion how is it uh, fair he should reflect the same prohibition while acting as an mp also unfortunately in passing the citizenship bill all the bjp mps have thrown the constitutional obligations into winds they've forgotten the core values of the constitution and passed a law which is based only on religion nothing else no other explanation is being given by them the other argument which i think is very relevant is see there is a big um what shall i say a uh, irreconcilable position between what is prevalent in assam of about which uh, the comrade will speak um uh, then what is prevalent in the rest of the country when we are saying what about the sri lankan tamils what about rohingyas what about the others who are coming across the border why don't you grant all of them citizenship do we really mean it i don't know but the assamese definitely don't want any kind of a leniency in grant of citizenship because they have a major problem which resulted in uh, uh, a lot of hartal and strife and um, finally the assam accord was signed in 1985 as a result of which people had to be identified as say, illegal immigrants and sent out because the supreme court in the case that involved the assam accord and the efforts of the central government to grant citizenship to all the illegal immigrants across the board there were certain enactments framed for that which went up to the supreme court and this present chief minister of bjp was a petitioner mr sonawal he was a petitioner in those cases challenging the central government's efforts to grant citizenship to all illegal immigrants from bangladesh now the assamese people have been agitating saying that our indeed right to our own indigenous culture our language everything is being threatened by these outsiders and what does the supreme court say the supreme court agrees with the petitioner it says that all these outsiders if they are permitted to settle down in assam they are going to be a threat to the preservation and uh, promotion of the culture of assamese people now i want to ask is it our culture to abjure a particular religion it is not indian culture is not that our culture is to um, live amicably with 
people of all religions and therefore are you not doing violence to that culture by saying my state's policy is to grant citizenship from for outsiders only if they belong to certain religion and not if they belong to the uh, Islam. The answer of the Home Minister is, no, 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 as far as citizens, uh, Muslims who are already citizens are concerned, it doesn't affect them in uh, any way. Now, I think that's a very, very, even a child will not accept that argument because uh, we know what is happening. A lot of my Muslim friends say that their children want to leave this country and go away because when a state proclaims that this particular religion is not a preferred religion of this government, what is the message that is sent across? That you are not wanted in this country. Today, a brilliant student of Pondicherry University was asked to go out to the convocation hall because she was a Muslim for no other reason. That is the kind of message that is being sent across. Therefore, we've got to understand who is the central government, what is their actual face, who has engineered this amendment, and what is their ultimate goal? Their ultimate goal is to convert India into a Hindu Rashtra. Their spokespeople have been repeatedly saying, we will see to it that the Muslims and Christians, no Muslim and Christian is left behind in India by 2021, one BJP spokesperson announces. In 2014, as soon as the first BJP government was formed. And this amendment act is only a translation of their dream. Therefore, friends, my uh, fervent plea is let us be vigilant. We have to understand the politics behind this move. Let us not allow it, the agitations to die down. We have to keep up the tempo and I would welcome many more discussions like this. Thank you.